That's that's mm. amazing. Just a step away from the business side now, mm-hmm. uh, on the personal side, what what would you say the the riskiest leap you've taken in your life, in your personal life? Yeah, wow. Um, but one of the biggest things for me, you know, I, I was always told from all my entrepreneurial um, classes and groups that I belong to that um, there was a book called The E-Myth, The Entrepreneurial Myth. And uh, Michael Gerber wrote it a few years back. And it basically states that, you know, the reason you start a company is to build it, set up systems, and so you can unload it and sell it for a big bag of cash. That's the reason you start a business. And so when the when the time came where we had a buyer, a British, a large British company mm-hmm. came at knocking on our door asking to, first it was a strategic alliance, which that's what I thought it was. And I flew to New York to meet them and know they wanted to buy us. Um, I was like, okay, I'm not for sale. And I came back to Vancouver and then, you know, a few weeks later they came knocking again and started offering, offering, offering. And then there was a price that we couldn't re- uh, refuse. And I went down this path and I'm like, okay, we're going to sell the business. And my business partner, Lawrence and I were fully engaged in selling it. We, our minds left running the business to selling it. Yeah. So that's not a good s- spot to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was, we had everything all packaged up to go. The due diligence was done. Um, they gave us a deposit and basically I, you know, everything was done. Mm-hmm. And then I was invited, I was back at MIT in Boston and the speaker, Lynn Twist came in, um, and she did this chat about the soul of money. She wrote a book called the soul of money mm-hmm. and it just it blew me away what she was, what she was saying. And then she invited myself and my family to go deep into the Amazon rainforest with her and spend time with uh, an indigenous tribe called the Ashwar tribe that their group, the Pachamama Alliance had only had contact with for 10 years. So they'd only had contact mm. with the outside world for 10 years, but it was only with this group. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah. I'm coming. Like I put it in my hand, I'm coming with yeah. you. <laughs> and so we took the family in and we ended up doing a ceremony which I didn't know we were going to do. And it was an ayahuasca ceremony, which is a, um, it's a vine, which is combined and turned into a, um, like a serum. And, you know, you have some and, and, um, basically go off on a, on a trip, I guess, on a journey, (laughs) on a journey. And you're laying on the, by, you know, on the side of the Amazon and you've got the banana, you're laying on a banana leaf and the banana trees are flapping in the wind. And I, I think it really got into my consciousness. Mm got deep down in my consciousness. Cause I, it, I was torn, you know, do I sell or don't I sell, but I'm going to sell. I'm going to get a big get bag of cash. That's yeah. everybody's yeah. entrepreneurial Your program dream. To, I'm programmed that's do, that right? way. That's all yeah. that I've ever been taught. And so I'm laying there and I'm, I, I have this, you know, I had a, a, a vision and I had this face come at me and, um, basically I, I, I feel that what it was telling me is saying, no, don't, don't sell the business. And I was like, wow. well, like, what do you mean? Don't sell the business. Like, don't sell the business keep the business, yeah. leverage the business to do good in the world. You know, whatever you think is good, you know, do good in the world. And I came out of this trance and I was like, what happened? And I just like, but I, I, it was, I was such a profound, had such a profound effect on me. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually came out of the Amazon and went back to Vancouver. I flew to London and I pulled the deal off the table and I said, it's not wow. for sale. Your, your partner must have been... Yeah. Wondering what did you did, what you did I know, on that yeah. trip. So he there, wasn't yeah. happy with me. He wasn't happy yeah. with me. Um, so we ended up, I, I pulled it off the table. I said, it's not for sale. And um, he really wanted to sell. So we struck a deal together where we bought him out mm. and Cameron took his spot. Right, right. Which worked out, um, which worked out really well. Um, but my biggest, what was the question again? <laughs> the, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the biggest leap, you know, in your, in your personal, yeah, I mean, the, I guess that kind of well, combines the, those two things because yeah, it does. obviously it is a, a business, uh, di- a huge business decision if, to keep that, yeah. but obviously that affects you personally. Too, yeah. I mean, right? the, so that was the biggest decision was, you know, not to sell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not the other way around. Yeah. It was not to sell, but yeah. and keep it and, and, you know, use the platform. Cause I had this platform of 35 years in in the industry, but globally too. Right. And you know that if I sold it, I would lose the plot. I felt that I'd lose the platform. Mm-hmm. I would lose this. I would lose that. Um, so yeah, being able to keep it and use and leverage the platform to do all these other yeah. cool things has been amazing. And, and at, at what point do you, 
Mm. Is there a certain point where you had a kind of focus on the environment and 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 the world versus uh, just business? Was there a spot where well, it's like? You know, yeah. I, I if you go way like quite far back in the book when I was younger, when I first went to Egypt, because mm-hmm. I was there on and off for five years, and I was in Venezuela before that, yeah. and I saw you know environmental degradation, you know oil everywhere, yeah. it was just horrible. And in Egypt, I saw the same thing on the Red Sea. And when right. I flew over with the helicopter pilot, and I, I flew, and, I, and he told me to take pictures, um, which I did. I was you know blown away, but his statement that he made this, the pilot, Johnny, um, before we even took our first helicopter flight, he was standing in the desert and there's like two helicopters on this pad in the middle of nowhere. And he, you know, he waddled out. He was a big guy and he waddled out and he says, you know, I know what you're trying to do, but do you really think it's going to make a difference? Yeah. And I was in my early twenties at the time and I thought, yeah, hell, I'm going to make a difference. I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. But that resonated me forever after that. Right. And, and I always wanted to make some kind of a difference. And if somebody's telling me that I'm doing something and it's not going to make a difference, well, that gets me even more motivated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I owe a lot, you know, to that statement that he made. Yeah. Because he kind of, you know, he, he kind of pushed me and said, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. Right, right. But I really don't think you're making yeah. a difference. Have you seen what it's like out here? Like, you can't change this. Yeah, yeah. And so you kind of had a twofold thing, I, I guess, from the business standpoint, mm-hmm. the products to help save the environment, but yes. also, you know, on a, on a larger level, yeah. um, you know, wanting to make a, a an impact, positive impact to, right, right. Know, globally. So yeah. yeah. And then I, I know, and so then I had the business where we were, you know, we were doing, you know, a lot of business around the world, mostly outside of North America, um, equipping um, like oil companies and navies and coast guards with response equipment, oil spill response mm-hmm. equipment, which would be on standby. It's like having a fire extinguisher in your house. You've got it on standby. That's our equipment. It's on standby, right? right, right. And they use it for training and hopefully never have to use it. Unfortunately, they use our equipment quite a bit. Yeah. So making a difference, there was the making a difference. So I had the business I had, because I was still working for my father's company then when I was working in Egypt. Right. And then when I came out and started AquaGuard, we had all these clients that I had met all over from Venezuela to Malaysia to you name it. Mm-hmm. That I was doing emergency planning for, but they needed equipment and they needed help. Right. And so therefore, when we started AquaGuard, I had a little bit of a client base that I could build on from there to help. And it was all about helping them. And then when I was able to do that the journey in, around the world, you know, we're kind of water people. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've always been a scuba diver. Um you know, and then I got into surfing when I turned 40, I started surfing, right, but I love, right. love surfing and I was around the water. And, um, I guess with skiing, it's, it's, oh, fro- it's skiing, frozen yeah, water, frozen right? water. Yeah. And then skiing <laughs> in the mountains. Yeah. You know, there's all this skiing. Yeah. It's all this stuff. And, uh, it was always my way of getting away, right? My getting a break to mm-hmm. clear my head. I would go, I climb a mountain and I would clear my head. I'd go surfing, clear my head, come back with hopefully fresh yeah. ideas. Um, but then when we were on this, this journey, um, I got, I really got choked, um, especially when I was in Indonesia. I was in Indonesia and we were there for about five weeks and we'd go surfing almost every day, you know, with my son and my daughter. Mm -hmm. And every time it would rain, you know, the, the creeks and the little rivers were full of this garbage and plastic and it would all get flushed out into the ocean. And then I'd be paddling into a wave to try and surf and I'd have all this stuff caught on me and I just couldn't couldn't get going. And I, like I said, this is absolutely not acceptable. Yeah. You know, this area here is one of the best surf spots in the world. It's in every surf magazine has been for the past 30 years mm-hmm. and it's full of garbage. Like you can't, can't be. Yeah. And then, so then that was in Indonesia. Then I went to Brazil, saw the same thing and went to all these other places and it was the same thing. And, and I think we think that the pollution in the oceans is isolated to only where it is. It's not, it's, it's a global yeah. issue. So we, um, I got back and with my kids, we created an app called True Beach Mm -hmm. and it's on iOS. So you can download it for free. And uh, I just, you know, want to bring awareness to the conditions of the beaches and oceans around the world. So, um, you know, what we've been doing is asking people, um, organizations that do beach cleanups, like there's Surf Rider Organization, Ocean Legacy, and so many others that do regular beach cleanups Mm -hmm. and five minute cleanup and et cetera. And I just asked them to, you know, post what they're doing, their amazing work and just post it, post it, post it and show the world, you know, what's going on. 
Um, cause typically a lot of nonprofits work like this. They work right. down their own path. They don't communicate with a lot of other ones mm-hmm. because they're looking for funding and whatnot. Yeah. But I think it's our job, um, is to show everybody what everybody's doing, all the good stuff everybody's doing. So yeah. therefore this platform, True Beach, is a platform for them to put all their, their beach cleanups and what mm-hmm. the cool stuff that they're doing so people can see it. And then just the general public, you go to the beach, you take a picture of what you see, good, bad, or, or any, and you post it and it just goes into this database uh, mm. for people to see what the true conditions. And hopefully um, with True Beach, what we're trying to do is just bring awareness and change to the tide of trash in our oceans. Mm-hmm. That's it. And um, so, yeah. yeah, so that's what, that really got me. That was, so, so recently that really got me going and that, that's only been going for about a year. Right. You know, right. after we got back, after our, our trip, we started this, this, it's become more of a movement than an app. Yeah. Um, this has a lot of um, presence on, um, you know, Instagram and all social media. And then we've got the app as well. Right, so, right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I guess in, the, in that sense, that, that technology is, is helping the cause, right? Helping... That's right. Awareness to, to things and, and yeah. And Actually, I think I've got a uh, where is it here? Yeah, here's one. Here's a. I'm not thinking. That's True Beach there, and it's probably too small <laughs> to see. But that's our little thing. Yeah. Well, definitely, we'll put some links in the. Uh, yeah, and we can put links. We'll put links like on that. there for yeah. that as well. Yeah, and then and then also I uh, another thing that I mean outside of the environment, you know what I'm what I'm doing now is because um, I'm dyslexic and I've got ADD I'm all over the place and uh, my son Devin is extremely dyslexic and has ADD and we, we've created a um, we've created another movement which is called giftadd.com or mm. giftadd gifted and we're trying to dispel this whole myth about dyslexic and ADD kids mm-hmm. um, that it's not a curse but it's actually a gift mm. and you know if I if I go to MIT, my class at MIT in Boston, I would say that 75% of the entrepreneurs in my class are, are ADD and dyslexic. Wow. And my coach, Kevin, Kevin Lawrence, who I've worked with for over 10 years, he works with CEOs all over the world, from Dubai to Australia to India. And most of the people he works with, successful entrepreneurs, are have ADD and dyslexia. Um, people like Richard Branson and Winston Churchill and these, these, you know, wow. these people, yeah, yeah, it's all. And so, but the, so what we, what we're trying to do is, is help kids in those, those fragile years and high mm-hmm. school again, high school where peer pressure and everything has a massive influence. Um, I saw, I mean, myself, I shriveled up into a very shy, non-confident person mm-hmm. in high school because I didn't want to say anything because I thought it was stupid. Yeah. And there's all this um, conformity too when you're in, in school. Exactly. And, right? yeah. Exactly. This conformity, you have to do this, you have to, you know, get whatever on your math tests and whatever, but you yeah. may be great at art. You may be great at public speaking, maybe, but that doesn't matter. It mm-hmm. has to be these things. Um, and then I saw my son, Devin, um, go through this, ho- this horrible pain from elementary school. And in grade four, he got pulled out and we sent him to a special school for dyslexic kids, 80 kids in the school you know, it may or may not have helped him, mm-hmm. but he wanted to go into a regular high school w- when he graduated from elementary school. So he went back to his regular high school and he struggled. He had mm. the hardest time, uh, but he liked sports. He liked rugby, he liked football, you know, he played hockey um, and he loved the camaraderie of the teams and the people and his friends. Yeah. Um, but he hated school. Like he wouldn't show up. So he would basically curl himself up in a ball in grade 11 and 12. It was the worst. He'd curl up in a ball every morning and have massive headaches, which I believe he had. Cause I, I used to get these anxiety or stress headaches mm-hmm. in, in high school and after that, and, uh, he just wouldn't go. And then his, uh, we got hauled into the principal's office, you know, which we often did. <laughs> and the principal said that, you know, do you realize that your son has missed 150, um, blocks and it's not wow. even Christmas yet. <laughs> yeah. We're like, yeah, we kind of knew that. Um, so, you know, the, the school thing for the, the ADD dyslexic kids is a really tough, but knowing that they're not freaks and they're not, um, you know, it's not a curse, but it's actually a gift. Mm-hmm. What I saw in my, especially my son, after he got out of high school, he was free. Right. And he was free to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. And he would, he would go and join this and go and join that. And then he, you know, well, what do you want to do? I want to go into acting school. Well, that's cool. Okay, go ahead. 
So you went and he did that and he's just like, oh, I'm actually really good at this. Mm -hmm. And then he, then he started getting this self-confidence. And then he got into this fire spinning troupe. Like they, they're a traveling fire spinning troupe that go to Burning Man in the Nevada desert every, yeah. and they're the number one fire spinning group there. And, and when the, the man burns, they're the, they, they got the first spot, uh, the number one spot last year. And they're auditioning again wow. for the spot again this year just to see them, him thrive and get his confidence. Yeah. So if he walked in the room right now, he would just, you wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. The, the kid that I knew in high school is not the kid now. Hmm. And now he's, he's, you know, he's, he's acting and he's, um, he's a working actor. So he's, he's done commercials and he's done TV shows and he's done films. And it's yeah. just like, he's, and he's only 22 and he's just having a great time. Wow. But it's finding, it's finding that thing that you're good at, you know, for, yeah. the, for these kids and then getting your self-confidence back because you lose it. You lose it pretty quick. So yeah. that's why we created this group called mm. Gift ADD, uh, gift, gift, giftaddd.com. And we right. share stories and we're actually making a documentary film on successful people, uh, about successful people with ADD and sharing mm. some stories. Yeah. So what, what traits would you say are that make that, that high uh, amount of successful people that do, do have. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I think it's the, just thinking, thinking in a different different way. Mm -hmm. Um, not necessarily, you know, you're told to do that. It's, I think it's the, it, it builds a character because the frustration that you feel as a kid, you all, you're always having to overcome adversity. Right. Always, yeah. always. So you're always pushing it. Right. And there was a, um, a speaker that came to my class at MIT a couple of years ago. And she talked about this. She said, if you're constantly pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. outside of the box, outside the comfort zone, your brain actually rewires mm. and it gets more accustomed to that. And, yeah. and so you actually grow and then you're able to handle um, these type of situations a lot more than somebody that has always just been, everything has happened or everything has come to them easily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, you know, that's not a bad thing, but, um, these guys, you know, they, they're, they're constantly battling adversity and they're constantly improving because of it, right. learning from it. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, that's, that's, yeah. So yeah, you, I, so I guess you if see, you take, always take the path of least resistance yeah. then things kind of are status quo, there's not, right. Not, not pushing you to. That's right. And think of what, how, how I could do this better. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, this is how it's done. That's how Everyone it's done. This, yeah. So. That's right. I'm just going to do it the same way. And I mean, some people, that's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah. But these people, they're just wired differently. So, right. and I mean, it can go the other way. There's a lot of jails that are filled with ADD <laughs> yeah, yeah. dyslexic people. Yeah. Right? yeah. right. So, you know, there, yeah. there's a thin line, you know, it depends on which sure. way. And but, I, you know, know I that's think how... it's the mentorships and. Right. Maybe that's how society handles that. Right. And, yeah, and if, yeah. if we can switch how that's yeah. viewed. Yeah. Um, and like you said, if that's viewed as a, as an asset or, or something that you can turn into something mm -hmm. um, that that's going to benefit you, then, uh, you know, maybe that, that, that's the shift that society needs or, yeah. you know, education or, or, yeah. you know. I, that runs and, and I think, it, you know, deep, like, right? like, like mentors or, you know, everything from your soccer coach to your martial arts instructor, mm -hmm. or whoever it is to have people, you know, that actually care about you and, and kind of guide you and mentor you. And yeah. then every, you know, business mentors and life mentors, coach, you know, all that, um, I think is paramount. There's the kids that don't have any of that, that right. could fall off because then you right. really start believing that you're dumb and you're not adequate yeah. enough. But the, the other ones that work with, you know, um, it could be a neighbor, it could be, you know, just mentoring and helping. Mm -hmm. I had a great uh, mentor when I was a kid. Uh, his name is uh, Lynn Wilson and his wife, Donna Mae Wilson. And they didn't have any kids. And I used to sail. I sailed dinghies mm -hmm. and I hated it. I just hated it. My parents stuck me in this sailing <laughs> thing when I was 10 years old. Hated it until this guy, Lynn, came. And then he mentored myself and another buddy of mine, Steve Moret. And he mentored us and we were, you know, we were uh, racing and, and winning uh, in the Canadian nationals. You know, we did mm. fairly well. And, but, and then we worked for him at Lake Louise uh, Ski Hill in Alberta where he, you know, he got his jobs. You know, I was a, a cook and my buddy worked in the, in the boot fitting shop, but he helped kind of mentor us through, through life and yeah, all these things. Yeah. So oh, I mean, wow. yeah. So he, he's, it was a profound, um, had a profound influence on me when I was a young kid where I, that. You know, I, I, I didn't have that from other mm -hmm. people. I mean, you my see, soccer you see some different outlets in life other than 
Yeah. Um, you know, comparing yeah. yourself to your classmates yeah. or whatever. That's right, yeah. And then I got heavily into, you know, skiing and backcountry skiing and all this because of Lynn. And then my sister Sue got me, you know, my sister as well, you know, dragged me out. Her boyfriends were mountain guides, so they would mm. drag me out and climb. And I mean, it was mm. just who I was lucky enough to surround myself with. I had really good mentors and then I had really good people that I was able to surround myself with. And I think that people with dyslexia and ADD, I mean, at school, when I was at BCIT, you know, I got kicked out after the first term because hmm. I failed. And the dean said, yeah, you can come, you can come back in, but you have to take uh, the courses you failed at, at night school and a full day load. And I'm like, wow. okay, sign me up. And all my friends thought, you're crazy. Like, just yeah. leave. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but I was really fortunate. I was, I had friends that helped me. And then I realized like through life that you need support. You need friends. You, if you isolate yourself, you're in, mm -hmm. you're, you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. You need to kind of pull on community and people to, because we're all in it together. Right. And so, you know, that helped me get through BCIT. That helped me get through. And then our, our you know, our business now, it's like, it's a team, right? We, we right. share, we share everything. And uh, it's more community as opposed to isolation and, yeah. and uh, you know, surrounding yourself with, you know, people that are smarter than you. Yeah. Um, that forces you to, you know, to kind of raise the bar mm -hmm. as well. So, hmm. yeah. Um, so I, I guess, you know, kind of tying all those things in together, what what really matters to you today after this journey, um, you know, this point in your business? Yeah. And, you know, I guess kind of reflecting on all that, like what is it, what are the things that really matter to you uh, in the present? Yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot in the past, you know, several years, Um but for me, my, my number one thing is my family, you know, is just don't sacrifice anything for your family. Um, and I just see it all the time, people sacrificing and then things mm -hmm. explode. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, you know, uh, in business, you know, every day is a business crisis. Every single day is a business crisis. And every oh, yeah. day that you can make an excuse up not to go see your son or daughter's hockey or ice skating or whatever. Yeah. It's really easy to do or not take that, vac you know, go for a one day vacation instead of a two week. Yeah. You know, it's easy to, oh, we can do a short one. No, it, you need, you need it's that time. So for me anyway, that's, that's the most important uh, thing is, is my family. I guess the uh, second one for me, I, I've really found a lot of freedom in being able to leverage the platform that I've been able to keep um, to do, to do really cool stuff, but meet really, really cool people doing amazing things. Yeah. Since I made that shift, like in 2010, I've been meeting so many people that are doing incredible things in the world as opposed to just grinding it out every day. Mm -hmm. that gr the grinding side is really hard. If you get into that zone where you're meeting people and you're, and you're hanging out with people and you're working together with people that are actually in it um, to change the world or whatever it is, um, yeah. but to, or to do good, it's a totally different headspace and you jump out of bed in the morning and with excitement, it's, um, and, and, and once you're in that space, it just grows and grows and grows. Like it's exponential. It just mm -hmm. takes off. It's incredible mm -hmm. place to be. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I get, I guess to, to, to finish, if you, yeah. if you think about the state of the world today mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. where human beings have gotten it, yeah. you know, what's your outlook on, on. The prognosis yeah. <laughs> long term for our kids. I right? know, you know. Yeah, for, and I, and I next, think about that all, all, you know, every, every day. And I've learned a little. I've learned a lot more about indigenous cultures over the past, you know, seven or eight years than, than, than ever. I've never. I didn't know anything before. Mm -hmm. um, and with indigenous cultures, most indigenous cultures around the world, they look seven generations in front and seven wow. generations behind, and they go not just well, the next what election, I, right? not the <laughs> next yeah election, next four years or whatever it's gonna be. <laughs> So they look, they say, what I'm doing right now is how is that going to affect seven generations in the future? And if we wow. think of things that way, mm -hmm. you know, but, and, you know, in the, in the world, I mean, we are in a, in a difficult time uh, right now, um, you know, with, um, you know, the, the, you know, the planet and politics and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I have a lot of hope. I, I, I've seen... You know, the youth, I'm, I have a lot of um, hope in our youth. I mean, they're amazing. You know, when we were, when we were kids, you know, <laughs> or even now it's like, oh, you know, my kids, they're lazy, you know, lazy. Yeah, yeah. We were lazy. <laughs> yeah. The kids these days aren't lazy. Yeah. And there may be some that are, but I mean, they, because they have technology, because yeah. they've evolved with technology, there's so much, uh, they're more interconnected than we were. I mm -hmm. mean, when I went to high school, we would, you know, hang out with the kids from our high school only in our grade. Yeah. Okay. That was it. 
Well, now, yeah. I mean, my I saw my kids, you know, they were in high, they were high, hanging out with three or four grades up and down, and then yeah. every high school in the whole region. Like, mm-hmm. they know everybody. Yeah. It's incredible. And then on social media, they're able to share their ideas. Some of it's, you know, kind of whatever, but there's a lot of really good stuff on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to help them share information on, even like I'm doing now, like beach cleanups. Okay, hey, we're doing this. And they see their friends. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to come and help you do that. Or, oh, mm-hmm. this. And um, so, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're connected. They're way more switched on than we were, were mm-hmm. you know, on this, the, the condition of our planet and politics. Um, so, I you know, I do have a lot of hope for the youth. I, I think that they're the next ones. You know, we messed it all up for them, yeah. unfortunately. Um, and, um, but they, they're pretty sharp and they're like sponges and they're learning as much as they can. And the, everything that we've ever known is all on your phone. Yeah, <laughs> all yeah, the knowledge yeah. that humans have ever known is on our phone. We had to go and look on microfiche yeah. or, in, or, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica and look up, you know, yeah. stuff. Well, everything, all, everything is, is there, um, good and bad. Right. But I think they're smart enough to be able to pull all the good out of it and then really make a huge difference, you know, for the, for the future here. So I, yeah, no, right, I, right, I feel, right. I feel good about that. And yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, Nigel, thanks so much for coming in uh, again. Yeah. Uh, Nigel Bennett, uh, entrepreneur, author of uh, Take That Leap. Uh, <laughs> of course, now available uh, as audiobook. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, thanks yeah. again for coming no, in. Thanks, Jimmy. Appreciate yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah, no problem. Fantastic. Yeah.